Welcome everybody, my name is Jason Williams, and welcome to our hospital medicine point of care ultrasound course covering lung ultrasound. Excited to have you today. This curriculum is available on my website, proceduralist.org. And I'm excited you're joining us for lung ultrasound today because I really feel it's the most useful POCUS exam to learn for hospital medicine. When I look back at my first 188 patients I scanned on radar rounds, I consulted on hospital ward teaching teams, and I found patients where I thought ultrasound could potentially change their diagnosis and influence their management plans. And in fact, 53% of the time, we found something new that the primary teams didn't suspect about their patient. And if you look at the most common misdiagnosis, several of them are pulmonary related, including pulmonary edema, or when they thought the patient had pulmonary edema, it turns out they had a dry lung or missed pneumonias. And when I go back and look at which point of care ultrasound exam changed diagnosis most frequently, 49% of the time, lung ultrasound added new information that the primary team was not aware of, higher yield than almost any other domain in point of care ultrasound for our hospitalized patients. So if there's any one ultrasound modality you're gonna learn, lung ultrasound I think is one of the easiest and has the biggest influence in terms of making misdiagnosis more readily available to you and your patients. So there's a lot to cover here. I've broken it down into four parts. Take your time and work your way through slowly. These courses are available always at my website and you can go back and reference them anytime. Here in part one, we're gonna go over acquiring quality images, including how to get A lines and B lines and what that means. Part two, we'll go over some cases and apply that information to volume status and CHF management. Then we'll talk about all the other things lung ultrasound can do, like diagnose pneumonia, atelectasis, pleural effusions, and pneumothorax. And finally, in part four, we'll apply all this information to some more diagnostic cases. All right, so for part one of lung ultrasound, we're gonna go over the evidence for lung ultrasound today. We're gonna to talk about setting up the ultrasound machine, and then how to find B lines, both what are they anatomically and physically, and how to bring them out with the ultrasound. They don't come natural, you gotta, you gotta work on bringing A-lines out. Then we'll talk about B-lines, what causes them and why they occur. We'll talk about the severity of B-lines. And finally, where should we scan on the chest? So I really encourage you to scan all patients with shortness of breath and hypoxia. They really should get lung ultrasound exam. If you compare chest X-ray, which we commonly get in most of our patients who come to the hospital with shortness of breath, Lung ultrasound outperforms chest X-ray in terms of pneumothorax, pulmonary edema, pneumonia, and pleural effusion. The sensitivity for ultrasound is so superior compared to chest X-ray. We're missing pneumothorax half the time, pulmonary edema 40% of the time, but the sensitivity for ultrasound is in the 90s. It performs amazing with similar specificity of ultrasound compared to chest X-ray. All right, now let's talk about setting up our machine. So first we have to select the right probe. You wanna start with a low frequency probe most commonly. You can either use the phased array, which fits nicely between the ribs, or a curved linear probe. It has a wider footprint, so you'll get a little more rib shadowing, but potentially see multiple lung spaces. Either is fine. And we use these low frequency probes when you're looking for things like A lines, B lines, effusions, and consolidations. Sometimes we do wanna use a high frequency probe when we're examining the pleura specifically if you're looking for pneumothorax or subpleural consolidations, and we'll talk about that in part three of this series. But for now, let's stick with our low frequency probe because we'll be looking for A lines and B lines. So now that we've selected the correct probe, now we have to input some settings into our machine. So most ultrasounds, you're gonna wanna switch the ultrasound settings to abdominal imaging mode. Cardiac software knows that there's gonna be artifacts from the lung adjacent to your heart. So what that software is trying to do is it's trying to remove A-lines and B-line artifacts in order to bring out your cardiac imaging. With lung ultrasound, we wanna accentuate these artifacts. So cardiac tends to be the worst setting. Abdomen instead is a good option. If your machine is more modern and has a lung ultrasound setting, these often ex accentuate those A-lines and B-lines and pleural sliding. So this can be a nice option but be aware your overall image quality will decrease. So you may have trouble picking up pleural effusions, consolidations, or masses because it gets quite grainy as you try to accentuate these artifacts. So you have to decide, are you looking for A-lines and B-lines and pleural sliding, 
Are you interested in a pleural effusion or pleural masses, at which point maybe you should switch to an abdominal imaging mode? Oftentimes we'll have to decrease the gain on our machine to bring out A lines and B lines, and you want to be sure to set the depth to 12 to 15 centimeters to really look for A and B lines as well. Okay, we've been talking a lot about A-lines. Let's talk a little bit about normal lung ultrasound anatomy so we can start to orient ourselves to this terminology. So here's our phased array probe. The probe marker is currently pointed towards the patient's head. Here's their feet, here's their chest wall. Closest to the probe will be the soft tissue, which you can see here. Here's, here's fat and muscle. And then below that will be a bright white line that comes out from underneath the ribs. So here's a bright white line, which is the pleura, and here's a rib. And you see the ribs cause shadowing. You have darkness adjacent to each rib because the ultrasound waves can't travel through the rib, which causes a shadow. And then you have these interesting A lines that come down here that are equidistant to each other. So from this A line to this A line is the same distance to this pleura, is the same distance to the top of the screen. And this is normal lung ultrasound anatomy. Okay, what are A-lines? If you remember one thing, A-lines are air. So if it's an aerated portion of lung, that rules out fluid. So if you see A-lines, that means there's no pulmonary edema, no effusions, no pneumonia. So what exactly is A-lines? It's actually an artifact, a reverberation artifact. So as your ultrasound waves enter the pleura and into the rest of the lung tissue, because air is filled the lung, those ultrasound waves, they scatter and none of them bounce back to the probe. There's nothing for your ultrasound waves to hit and bounce back. It's just a bunch of air. A few of the ultrasound waves, though, will hit the pleura and bounce back to the probe and bounce back again. And the reason for this is the pleura is very dense and reflective, so you get a few ultrasound waves that are trapped up here bouncing back and forth. So this is a pleural line, but as these waves bounce back and forth, the machine is kind of stupid, and it thinks it's hearing a pleura, 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 pleura. It's an echo reverberation of a single ultrasound wave bouncing back and forth. And that's what this animation tries to highlight, is you get a normal ultrasound wave highlights the pleura, but then that ultrasound wave can start to bounce back and forth between the probe and the pleura, and the probe thinks there's additional pleural lines that are deep and deep and deep, as you can see here. And that's why A-lines are always equidistant from the top of the screen to the pleura, to the next A-line, to the next A-line, because it's the same distance up here that this ultrasound wave is bouncing back and forth at. Just an echo reverberation artifact. Okay, so how do we acquire this image that we showed? It, it doesn't come naturally. you got to work for it. So first thing is when you put the probe on the chest, you want to identify the pleura. That's going to be a bright white line under the rib. So for instance, I see a shadow here. So right next to the shadow, this bright white line is going to be pleura. I see a bit of a shadow here, which means this bright white moving line is the pleura itself. You want to slide either towards the head or towards the feet to try to center this pleura. So in this case, I'd want this pleural edge to be more in the middle of the screen, and I do this by sliding the probe towards his feet, which would center, center this pleura. Here's a nice well-centered pleura with ribs on the side and pleural line right in the middle. Next, once you've centered the pleura, you can rock the probe to make it more horizontal. This pleura is at an angle, and if you rock the handle towards the feet or towards the head, that will, that will uh, make this pleural line more horizontal as well. And then once you have the pleura in the middle and horizontal, then you can start to fan the beam to the patient's right or to their left in order to get your ultrasound beam perpendicular to the chest wall. That's really essential for your A-line and B-line exam. You'll remember from physics of the ultrasound, if you send an ultrasound wave perpendicular to the pleura, you'll maximize the amount of echoes that are bouncing back at you. If your ultrasound is at an angle to the pleura, these ultrasound waves will pop off at a 90 degree angle and fewer of them return to the probe. And as a result, you have less of those echoes, echoes, echoes bouncing back and forth. So you've got to get your probe perpendicular to the pleura to bring out A lines and B lines. So what is the right angle? So 
anteriorly, you're gonna to have to change the angle here as you start to circle around the chest. To get perpendicular, your probe is gonna change angles in order to get perpendicular to the pleura, depending on where you are in the thoracic cavity. And it's really important that you need to see at least one A-line or B-line for a diagnostic scan. So for instance, here's a rib, there appears to be a shadow, and this looks like a pleural line. I see so a bright white echogenic line with movement, but there's no A-lines. So I can't tell whether or not there's fluid or anything here because my probe is not perpendicular. Versus here, this is not the best image. We're, we should probably rock to make this, hor this pleural line a little more horizontal, but we have rib shadow, rib shadow, pleural line. And even though it's faint, this is a single A-line. This is a diagnostic study, and there might even be a second A-line appearing down here. And I know it's equidistance from the top of the screen to the pleura and from this A-line to the pleura as well. So this would be diagnostic, and this would be non-diagnostic. I really can't rule out pulmonary edema on this exam because I haven't found at least one A-line. So if you can't find an A-line, the most common reason is your, your beam is not perpendicular. So try fanning back and forth or rocking to get your probe perpendicular. Another issue is you may have too much gain. So here's an issue where the gain is too bright, and when you turn down the gain, you can see the A-lines become more apparent. But finally, one of the more common reasons is that the chest wall and subcutaneous tissue is just too thick. You can imagine if you're standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon and yell across the Grand Canyon, you're not gonna hear an echo because the walls are too far away. If someone's chest wall is five centimeters thick, it's really hard to bring out A-lines because fewer of the waves can get down to the pleura and bounce back and forth because they're being absorbed in this thick sub-Q tissue. You're just not gonna hear an echo, echo, echo because the pleura is so deep. And that's probably the issue in this case is the pleura is just too deep, the chest wall is too thick. Okay, next we've talked about A-lines. What are B-lines? So B-lines are bad, it's usually some pathology. Most commonly, it's gonna be cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Could also be seen in pneumonia, ARDS, and interstitial lung diseases as well. What are B-lines exactly? So normally, if you look at your interlobular septa here, most of it is filled with air. You have these yellow al alveoli filled with air, a few lymphatic vessels and interlobular septa here, but they're so thin, you really can't conduct ultrasound waves through this air-filled intralobular unit of lung. But when you fill this unit with more fluid, now it becomes more dense and you can start to transmit sound waves through the intralobular septa. They've thickened to the point where you can actually send single sound waves in here. So what causes thickening of the intralobular septa? It's basically anything that causes ground glass opacities on chest CT. As you start to put fluid in here, whether it's CHF or pneumonia, you can transmit sound waves. But the other thing to think about is pulmonary fibrosis. That fibrotic lung tissue thickens the connective tissue in the lung and interlobular septa, and that'll also cause a lot of B waves. So B lines are ground glass opacities or pulmonary fibrosis on CT. It's very similar pathology. Now let's make sure we can recognize B-lines versus normal artifacts. So the characteristics of B-lines include these laser-like vertical spotlights. They should extend to the bottom of the screen, which is why we set our screen depth to 12 to 15 centimeters. And as spotlights, they should widen as they approach the bottom of the screen and become more prominent. And they move with lung sliding. As those thickened interlobular septum are moving up here as the lung slides, so should the B-lines as well. This image, you may be confused and wonder if there's a vertical line coming here. When in fact, this is just normal lung artifact. This vertical line doesn't reach the bottom of the screen and it fades with time. Unlike these B lines, which reach the bottom of the screen, become wider and more prominent as they come to the bottom. This is a Z line and just a normal artifact. In fact, you can see A line, A line, A line in this normal artifact. This is normal. These are pathologic B-lines. Now that we can recognize B-lines, we should always grade the severity. As the lung becomes wetter and wetter or more fibrotic, you'll have increasing number of B-lines and they'll become thicker and more persistent on the screen. For instance, a lot of people would call this a normal lung exam if you have less than three B-lines. 
these vertical lines come and go, and there's just one or two of them in this image. Here's a more mild to moderate picture where you have increasing number of bee lines. Some of them are getting thicker and more prominent. There certainly appears to be about at least three, if not more. As the bee lines has become thicker and more prominent, they'll stay on the screen for the full respiratory cycle. So there's not a time during this whole respiration where no bee lines are present. And some of them are very thick. So this is increasing severity of pulmonary edema or interstitial infiltrate. And finally, when the lung becomes wetter and wetter, it almost becomes like a solid tissue, the bee lines become very thick and prominent, and you have severely edematous lung in this case. I think that normal lung can have less than three bee lines, but if you find a lot of bee lines widely distributed that are two bee lines here, one bee line there, another two lines there, that could be abnormal and could be mild pulmonary edema. So let's look at this controversy, whether one to two B lines could be pathologic. So if you look at a lot of, a lot of the literature, they define pathologic number of B lines as three or more. Some of the reasons that number uh, arose, because it definitely predicts CHF readmissions, and it's commonly used for research protocols. The thought was originally you could have one bee line if you place your ultrasound probe right over the fissure of this lung. And this pleural fissure will allow you to use C ultrasound waves traverse into the fissure and you may get a single bee line. And maybe what if you put your probe right here at the fissure between the right middle, right upper, and right lower, maybe you'll get two bee lines on the screen as ultrasound waves traverse into this fissure. Also, occasionally, some patients may just have a little bit of mild pulmonary edema in the posterior lung zones that could be one to two bee lines just from gravity alone and may not be pathologic. So if you just see one to two bee lines and it's just in one location here or one location there, that's probably not pathology, could be normal variation. But if you see multiple lung zone with two bee lines here, two bee lines here, two bee lines here, that could be a widely distributed but mildly edematous lung. And here's a study that proves that point. So this is a nice scoring mechanism where they looked at ultrasounding four different lung zones in the upper and lateral areas of each hemithorax. And they added the total number of B lines in these four zones in patients that had CHF. And at the time of discharge, they asked which one of these patients come back. And if their total B-line score was seven or more, there was a statistically significant increase in heart failure, hospitalization, or death. So in other words, if you had two B-lines here, two B-lines here, two B-lines here, and two B-lines here, that would be eight total B-lines. You were much more likely to come back with CHF because your lung is still wet. Even though each one of these lung zones only has two B-lines, it's technically less than three, this is significant pathology that predicts CHF readmissions. So if you have one to two B lines, but they're widely distributed, that could be significant pathology. Versus if you just had one to two B lines in zone three and everything else was totally normal, that could be a, an artifact and you could ignore those one to two B lines as long as they're not widely distributed. So based on this study, I've adopted the B line counting technique used in that previous article. So if you look at this image, it looks like there's a lot of beelines. They come and go, I don't know, maybe four or five, because um, there's a different geographical areas as the patient's breathing, and you see beelines here, there, everywhere. But the way I like to score beelines is I'll freeze the image and count the greatest number of beelines on a single still image. So if I freeze here on this same patient, there's clearly a beeline here, Maybe one's fading away, it's hard to tell, but this is a pretty thick B line. This could be two B lines fused together. So this score would probably be at least two, maybe three. As this B line fades, here's a single B line still prominent, but this one becomes a little more prevalent. And maybe there's another B line here. So again, this is like a one, two, maybe three B line. And here you can see another very prominent B line, B line here. So this is a two. So overall, though, it looks like there's a lot of beelines on this. In a single freeze frame, it's just two to three would be how I would score this particular lung segment. Again, borderline pathologic, but if this is widely distributed, this certainly could be CHF or pneumonia. 
So where should we scan when we're doing lung ultrasound? There's no one consensus, but in general, the more zones you scan, the more sensitive you'll be for picking up pathology. Remember, we're only examining the pleura directly under our probe. It's not like a CT or chest x-ray where we look through the entire chest. So if you want to increase your sensitivity, you should do additional zones. This eight zone method is very popular. Many research articles use this. Many people teach the eight zone method. This four zone method, like you just saw, has some prognostic implications and it's easy to do, which is really nice. There's also a 28 zone protocol and I've even seen a 78 region lung ultrasound protocol looking for PE and these teeny tiny little pleural infarctions. But what we can see about all of these protocols, none of them look at the back of the lungs. Um, and that can be a highly, highly useful place to look where a lot of pathology is missed. So what I practice is at least three points on each chest. So a total of like a six zone protocol, making sure you get anterior, lateral, and posterior. Preferably sitting the patient up or rolling them over to really examine this posterior lung zone. And each lung zone has different usefulness. So if you have a pneumothorax, the most likely place to find that pneumothorax will be anteriorly because that air bubble floats up towards the surface. Laterally is where we pick up a lot of pleural effusions. And posteriorly is where pulmonary edema will start. So this is a very sensitive area for picking up CHF. Also aspiration pneumonia tends to start down here. And chest x-ray commonly misses this location. For instance, if you look at this chest x-ray, looks very clear, nothing to worry about. But behind the heart or under the diaphragm is a consolidation that was missed. And so ultrasound can look behind the heart or behind the diaphragm and pick up these pneumonias that are commonly missed. So I really encourage you to look at the posterior lung zone. It's commonly missed on chest x-ray and it's a good place with a lot of pathology. All right, let's summarize. So to find A lines and B lines, we're going to start with a low frequency probe in the abdomen or lung setting. At minimum, we want to look at anterior, lateral, and posterior lung zones on both sides. You really want to bring out A lines and B lines by getting perpendicular to the pleura, and that's what's going to cause these artifacts to really jump off the screen. A lines are air and normal. B lines are bad, commonly fluid or fibrosis. And always think about the beeline severity, both in terms of the number of beelines you're seeing, how thick they are, and how persistent they are through the respiratory cycle. And also think about the distribution. Is it just one lung zone that has them? Is it asymmetric? Is it bilateral? Is it throughout a lot of lung zones? Or is it just one lung zone? This will help you grade the severity of your lung infiltrate. All right, that concludes part one. When you're ready, you can move on to part two, and we'll start applying these concepts to commonly encountered patients in the hospital. Again, you can find this lecture and all others at my website at proceduralist.org. Thanks again.